Yes. Started about two minutes. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Shady Rose. I'm the events manager here at Lost City Books. I will detangle myself uh, presently. That's better. Um, a few things before we get started. Please go ahead and silence your cell phone out of respect for our speakers today. Uh, we want to hear every delicious word that they have to say, and phone ringings just kind of ruin that a little bit. Um, secondly, this event is being live streamed, and though none of you all are visible, if you ask a question later on for the Q&A portion, your, your voice will be on the live stream. Uh, 
speaking of questions and comments, we will have at the end of the discussion. So if you can hold on to those until the end, you will be greatly rewarded with wonderful answers. After the main part of the discussion, we'll move into um, some henna art and we'll have a really cool video playing. So you'll have the chance to mingle. We'll have some tea together. It's going to be a really wonderful experience. Um, so stick around for that. It's going to be really great. I'm going to introduce our speakers today. Let's sit back down for that one. Shamora Sheikh, Sheikh, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is the curator of the Feminine Arts for Rites of Passage Institute, a position she has held since 2010, where they focus on healing through the feminine arts. She is the author of Henneglyphics, excuse me, How to Henna, Fatina, and the Gold Adornments, and the Meal Treasury. Raised in the henna culture, for her, being a professional henna artist is one aspect of a larger tradition. Her work in henna art and design has led to diverse commissions, including fashion shows, performances, weddings, retreats, art museum exhibits, and music album covers. Hmm, I'll have to ask you about that later. She has worked as a henna artist for over 20 years and gives lectures, workshops, workshops, and seminars on henna body art, science, and history. With a BS degree in sociology, much of her early career is in K through 12 education. She lives in North Carolina with her how do you pronounce this? Zauj? Zauj. Zauj. <laughs> Where they homeschool their star seeds and drink tea around the fire pit. Find her teaching belly dance at a Zikr circle or online at passageinstitute.com. Kadis James, known as Empress, is a podcaster, YouTuber, jewelry designer, and co owner of the vintage clothing store and cafe shop Waste Not Want Not in the Gambia. Presently, she is documenting her repatriation, building projects, and homesteader journey to the Gambia on her YouTube channel, Global Green Book. She is also the creator of Thai by Kittist, a lifestyle brand focusing on bridging two worlds together, the diaspora and African. Thai by Kittist's goal, Kittist's goal is to highlight a holistic and natural approach to life. Empress implements cooperative economics by supporting other creators and entrepreneurs, featuring them on her show, Wake Up Wednesday, which you can find on her YouTube channel, Global Green Book. She also has a show called The Sisterhood Series, a show for women discussed by women who empower women on various topics such as women's wellness and health. She hosts panels of experts that can enlighten and educate her audience to a more natural approach. And without further ado, please welcome our speakers for today. I guess we'll start with uh, introducing ourselves as well and like uh, how um, our first experience with Hannah and how we got into Hannah and, uh, and how we got into the uh, be connected with Hannah. Yes. And we Okay, um, well, because this is all about henna gothics, and I enjoy the book thoroughly, it's a really good book. Let me just share my experience with henna through Shamor and my previous experience with henna um, prior. Uh, my first encounter in henna was in my early 20s, uh, and it was more of, I thought it was cute, you know, sexy, you know, it was more of a hippie type of girl. And so I didn't really think much about henna. And then I got into when I realized that I was never one for like dyes and things like that. So I learned to henna in your hair. So it was more of aesthetic things for me. It was nothing really I was connected to, but the more you're introduced to um, certain cultures and lifestyle, you become more enlightened. And so through my journey through it, you know, you meet people from different cultures. And that was my introduction. I was introduced first through the, um, uh, the Indo-Pak community um, before I even uh, was introduced through the African community. Uh, during my time as a Muslim was when I then started experiencing the African side of heaven. And I was wild because I it didn't dawn on me 
henna was originally, you know, originated in Africa. So as I started interacting with women and I saw the, just the culture and how it was just a, a full range of just sitting and sharing and talking and, you know, um, you're having the art and you're learning about their experience. And it was a multicultural thing in Islam because now it was Indo-Pak, is that the correct terminology? I'm not sure, the Indian community, mm -hmm. the African community, the, the Black American. So now I'm seeing the full spectrum. It was the Middle Eastern women. So it was like all of us are sharing this one common denominator of henna and it it became more of a spiritual experience and I was looking forward to henna not so much for the aesthetics of how it made me look but for the sisterhood and just being able to have another woman caress me in a non-sexual way but in a loving caring way because you know it's just like they're caring about how you look and how you feel so for me, it became a more of a, a beautiful sisterhood experience. And um, then when I met my sister Shamora, it went to the next level because my sister, she deals with the, the more holistic, natural approach to Anna. And I did not realize um, how therapeutic and healing it could be as well when you're doing the whole, I mean, it's, she gives you a, oh, an experience of a lifetime, like none I've ever experienced. And, and it's just a connection that I feel that every woman should experience and that we miss out here on the West because of the culture that um, is not geared towards more of, um, I guess, the Middle Eastern Africa way of lifestyles from the way it's very different. And we're missing out on that that piece of the system and connection, you know, the loving, the touching, the nurturing, the caring, the adornment, which I appreciate appreciate love, and that I got to bring my girls up in. And so they got to experience it. And so it was a piece that I never got to experience. And then she helps me take it to a next level because she teaches me so many things in this book. It's amazing. That's my about hemoglyphics. Um, and when she starts talking, you understand why it's like she came to a different level because I'm wild about her her knowledge of you know just the components and the, the stories and things that I never got to experience. And so she takes me back to where I now kind of feel a connection to my African roots that we kind of miss out being raised here in the West. So that's what I Thank have to you. Say. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for being here. Yeah. I'm so excited. So I'm Shamora SM Sheikh, and this is Kenny Um, I guess, um, my earliest experiences with Hina, uh, um, I was just a little girl. Um, the women in my community would have these get togethers every week where they would get together and belly dance and have tea and, and get their Hina done, you know? And I was just one of the, you know, start out being one of the, uh, you know, young girls that's just running back and forth. And they kind of would put all of us, all of us children in one room. And we were supposed to pay together and stay out of their hair pretty much while we had there. But I was kind of always squeezing my way up in there. And I just, you know, I would even go to the extent of like going to dig henna combs out of the garbage because, you know, they didn't finish all of them. So if you could get a few out of the garbage, you could still squeeze a little bit out and then like play with it or use it, you know, on your friends and things like that. So I would do that. And then um, they started out with letting me help with basic, basically the laundry work, which is mixing in the kitchen and preparing the paste for the party. So I started out just in the kitchen helping out with sifting, mixing, it's very messy. Um, and it's, the, it's probably the dirty work that nobody else really wants to do. It's not the glamorous side of henna. But that is where I started. Um, and it just pretty much, I mean, I never at one point think I was like, I'm gonna be a henna artist. It just happened, <laughs> you know? And wherever I went, it's followed me in life. 
And once people figure out that I do henna, um, you know, it just starts off with one person and then it's like wildfire. Next thing you know, you have a line out the door <laughs> and you're at every function, whether it's a wedding or a naming ceremony or, you know, anything like that. So um, you had mentioned the album cover. That was actually Nina Freeman's album that just came out a year ago. And uh, I did um, her henna for her photography shoot for her in it for her um, album cover. So it was marvelous to be featured on there. Um, she won a Grammy for that. And she won a Grammy for that. Yes, she did. So amazing to work with artists um, and, to be, and to be featured and um, be part of fashion shows and everything like that. But those are my earliest memories of henna. And um, it was important. So when I started, you asked earlier about like, you know, what inspired me to write the book. But in the beginning, I actually was working on a class and I was writing my curriculum for the class. And I just said, nah, we're going to put this on the back burner. This needs to be a book, you know, and I just hadn't seen, you know, there's not a lot of henna books that are out there. And there's especially not a lot that are, when you do find them, a lot of them are pretty much hallmark in like Indian or Mindy, like Indian style henna. And I didn't really see anything out there. My background is from Senegal, part of my family. So that's more what I grew up in. I just didn't see that represented anywhere. And then as I got off into the history and everything, you know, you realize that the, the plant itself originated in Egypt like 6,000 years ago. It's this long, full history of women's artistry. And I was just like, I don't see this anywhere. So I was like, this is putting that mark, you know, in history and um, having a voice for that. Um, and that is really what I wanted to do and how I came up with the book. So um, I guess um, there's three parts to the book. Uh, so it's more than just a how to hint a book. Um, it's the whole entire, uh, like, it's like, there's white bread, then there's like, cold bread. Okay. It's like, it's the whole package. <laughs> well, um, as a person who was gifted the book uh, to read early, I was expecting more of a tutorial when I saw the book. I was expecting more of a tutorial, something to kind of teach you, like, how to do the henna, how to do the design. But then as I started diving deeper in the book, she goes into the science part of it you know, the mixology, um, the, the scientific names, the it break down the components, um, the healing property. Uh, she has sections where stories that were told when the women would come together to do the head of the different uh, stories that were passed down. When I, and, and when I started, I'm like, wait a minute, this book is way more than what I anticipated. It went into the history, the deep history of henna and how it um, affected not only our community, but other communities. And I was just like telling my, my, my sister, I was like, I understand why you ghosted me for so long <laughs> because this book was so much more than I had anticipated. And and, 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 and it was a, a, a surprise. And in this book, you're not only getting an education on how to do the artistry, you'll get so much more. You'll have um, your tools, uh, stories there from an Islamic background. You'll have stories, addicts, but just, you know, stories of, uh, that women shared with each other and, you know, to have the laughs and the intimacy. It's, 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 it's such, I was so surprised. It's such a great book. It really is. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Alfred. Um, so there are three parts to it. Um, it definitely is a tutorial as well. And um, there are black and white um, uh, pictures or I should say illustrations that um, I hand, everything in there is pretty much hand drawn. Um, so the designs are in there and easy to follow. They're broken down step by step. But then, so that's part one. So part one is tutorial. And in that, it also breaks down the symbolism that is used and also which tribes it originates from and what they need. So you have that in part one. And part two is what I call the henna quest. So what I wanted to do with that is I wanted to, I wanted to take you back <laughs> when this was like, popping off and like what it would have been like in its own context and to experience that. So what the story does, it takes you on that trip with these three women, you know, who are basically in a race to save this baby from being buried alive. So, but through that, they're discovering henna and it helps them along their journey in many different ways. And they're having to follow basically this map of henna, which they find and each time they find it on a certain woman, 
this particular symbol or whatever in henna, then it gives them a clue as to the next place in their journey that they have to go to to get to their destination. So it's you're uncovering things about henna and how it works and things that it does to help them in the journey, but you're also, you know, um, learning, you know, and getting them closer. So that's part two, and that's the henna quest, and it has study questions throughout it. And then part three is when basically is the, I would say the handbook. So that part is more so your recipes. And it's everything from specific henna recipes, whether it's for a wedding, because what you mix for a bride is different than what you would mix for a naming ceremony. Mm -hmm. So it has like the different types of henna you do for different ceremonies, but then it also has like the himam recipes, which is like your bathhouse recipes, like for your hair, for your mask, for your facials, things like that. So all those are in there. And then it goes, like she said, through the science, um, what each ingredient, the, the role that it plays in the paste, why I put that in there, what is it doing for you and how can you make it even better um, so that you get the best fresh um, paste you can get to get the best thing that you can get. Um, and I think that pretty much covers, and it also goes through ceremonies. Um, there's a, about probably seven different ceremonies because it's like, it's pretty much infinite numbers of different henna ceremonies. But this goes through about like, I believe seven of them. And in each of them, it highlights a story, a prayer, a song, the tea that's served at that ceremony, the type of henna designs that are used for that ceremony. And we get all that for each one. Because like I said, I want to give it a very holistic um, experience as far as henna. I didn't want to just be like, okay, here's a recipe. This is how you do it. Here's some pictures of some pretty henna. Boom. I wanted to give the whole meal and the whole experience. And so that's what it is. It's, it's a whole henna experience. So I think at this point, um, do, should we get into the question and answer or should we do the excerpt? Let's go to hear the excerpt. Okay. Is there anything else that you guys need to add before I get to the excerpt? Oh, how long do you have a uh, it's a lot. It's a lot in that book. Um, is there something that people can take the book and and um, teach themselves how to? Do you have any courses available? Uh, it's definitely, I feel like you can. It's a, it's a class in the book. So I feel like you can definitely teach yourself with it, but there will be classes coming up in spring of 2023, and they'll be online and in person as well. So finally getting that done. <laughs> that was the first part of the mission. All right, so I think I'm gonna read today a part from the Henna Quest, which is uh, like almost like a mini novel that is in the middle of the book in part two. Um, there's also many stories, as I said, that said with each ceremony, and those are like short stories, but this one is more like a like I said, a mini novel. So there are these um, three characters, the best friends, Amina, um, Net, and Hanuti. And Hanuti is the Henna artist. Henuti means Lady of Hina in ancient Egyptian. And this story, it doesn't, I mean, the beginning of the story is a map of ancient Egypt or Kemet, as, you, as we would say, with all the ancient Egyptian names. So, like, the Nile is not just the Nile. And then also, there's a glossary of ancient, um, of, um, ancient Egyptian, which is used throughout here in the language so you know the meanings of the words. And then there's also a list of the characters and their names and, like, the meaning line. And so, all that's in the front. And the table of contents. So in this particular scene, let me see. I mean, I mean, this is at the beginning. This is only chapter two, so it's not very far into the story itself. So it's kind of like introducing the characters a little bit. So here we go. And at the beginning of each chapter, there is an illustration. So I wanted the illustration to be pictures that of like what you would use in henna art, in henna body art. Um, when you're designing it, but also to be meaningful to the chapter as well. So this one is opening with the hand of Fatima or the Hamsa, as some would say, um, which translates in Arabic as five, just like you have five fingers. And it has such a deeper meaning than just that, but that's what this opens with and it becomes important to the chapter itself later on. All right. Amina knew when Net said something needed to be done to do it. No questions asked. They stood up and Amina followed her. Although they didn't know Hanuti's whereabouts, she knew that Net could figure it out with her other sense. She followed. Amina at 5'8 towered over Net, who was a slim five feet. The tattered ends of, her, of Net's black sari trailed behind her, dragging on the marble floor. Amina felt at any moment she might step on it, trip over Net, 
and crashed to the ground, crushing her mousy friend with a loud crescendo. Amina focused as if she was tracking a sharp antelope. They wove their way through the maze of women in the main hall. They could feel the drumming in their chest, the ebb and flow of the call and response songs reverberated through the air, accented by waves of laughter. Candlelight and lanterns lit the dim room, tables laden with trays of food and tea. Ribbons of jewel tone fabric draped the ceiling. Curtains covered the stucco walls. Groups of women beautifully dressed with henna, makeup, and jewelry danced and sat clustered on cushions conversing. In some corners, a hookah was passed around. In others, a heated game of cement. Children ran around in, in packs playing hide and seek in the large hallway or outside. It was a festive midsummer night's atmosphere. Amina, being tall, a socialite, and, um, and one of the top merchants of Sumet, turned heads as, if, as she trailed behind Net. Along the way, ladies hugged her, gave greetings, and nodded. A few attempted to pull her to the side for conversation, no doubt something their husbands had put them up to asking. But she quickly cut them off, letting them know she would return. Despite her limp, Net was moving full steam ahead, and she didn't want to lose her tiny friend in the crowd. Net walked into a room that led to a shut door. She turned the knob, but it seemed to be jammed. She stepped back and Amina pushed it in with her shoulder. They caught their balance as they stumbled into the room. Hanuti and an older woman, her body as heavily laden with golden jewelry as her eyes were with coal, were so engrossed in arguing that they didn't notice the two women had entered the room. There's nothing I can do, noble lady. I can do her henna first thing tomorrow. How does it look if a bride does not get henna tonight? There is too much to do tomorrow. She can't get married without henna. It wouldn't be proper. Great noble lady, she will have henna. I will do it early tomorrow, I can assure you. Just do your job, shrieked the noble lady, her pale skin flushed. I can't do it with her like that. She will mess it up. She will look like she has leprosy, not henna, explained Hinuti near tears. She kept pushing her wild afro curls down and back against her neck with her fist as she paced. Her mahogany afro complimented her reddish brown skin, her heavily beaded pink cap and swished about her curvy body. As a noble lady moved to smack Hanuti, Nett walked up to the noble lady and put her hand on her shoulder and looked at her directly in the eyes. The noble lady's face relaxed and Nett locked eyes with her. Nabet Hanuti, we will see you as soon as the sun rises, the noble lady softly agreed. Net lightly smiled and the noble lady mirrored her smile. Amina snickered at how Net had the noble lady with the title of highest respect in native Egyptian language. The nobles did not speak native Egyptian and they certainly did not address royal tenants with reverence. She loved it when Net pushed people. Great noble lady, she will need to drink lots of clean water with rosemary and lemon, no fermented drinks, advised Hanuti, believed to see Net and Amina. It seemed as if they were always rescuing her. Things often got hairy with the nobles. Hanuti went about the room collecting her boxes and bags. Hanuti, who always had herbs and, hand, and on hand pulled some sprigs of rosemary from her bag and warmly placed it into the noble lady's hand. The noble lady gratefully received the green herb, lifting it to her nose for a whiff. Hanuti had not been trained at the house of life because there were not any doctors in her family. Her family farmed. However, her self-taught knowledge of herbs was as good as any sinu. Between her skills as a henna artist and herbalist, she had been saved from the backbreaking life of a farmer. She started out doing henna on Amina's mother. Amina's Mother used her ample resources as wife of chief military steward to support her craft. Not only did she procure Hanuti's artistry, she provided all of her materials and showered her with gifts. It was only a matter of time before all the ladies wanted to know who was gracing Amina and her mother with such titillating opera designs. And so her lot changed for the better. Instead of threshing and winnowing Emma, she used her kern to grind henna leaves, while her family, like other farmers, worked under the hot sun pond fields and planting. Hanuti mingled with the wealthiest ladies of Swinette in a decadent coolness of stone palaces and party halls. Thank you, Nabet Hanuti. Have a great night.
With that, the noble lady turned and went through another door to the inner chamber. Timothy exhaled and mouthed, thank you to her dearest friends. You're welcome, yelled Hanuti as they exited the room through the door her friends had entered. As soon as they reached the hallway, Hanuti dropped all her bags and slid down the wall to the marble floor and exhaled. She placed her palms over her eyes. Her friends, one on each side of her, squat on their hunches and rubbed her shoulders. Hanuti let her hands fall to her lap and smiled. They all burst into laughter. She embraced them. You saved me. What happened? I mean, a laugh. Nobody was nailing you to the wall. The bride was high. She climbed, she was climbing the walls out of her mind. What? Yes, someone gave her something for nerves, probably Mandrake. She wasn't still enough for me to do her henna. Then she vomited on me. So no henna tonight, but I can decorate my friends. Come on. They each grabbed some of her bags and hauled off to the section of the main room Amina had reserved. They all took a deep relaxing breath when they reached their oasis. Chilled glass bottles of tamarind juice and water awaited them along with a platter of berries, melons, and prickly pears. As soon as they collapsed on the cushions, a girl appeared and poured them each a cup of Marissa. After consulting with Amina, she disappeared and returned with a tray of kebabs, cabbage rolls, and stuffed dates. Nett, who was always fasting, and didn't eat anything, but she did drink some water. Hanuti and Amina, on the other hand, dug in as Hanuti filled them in on the evening's adventures with the bridal party. Hanuti swiftly opened the latch of a box and pulled out a bowl of henna paste and a long pointed wooden stick. She set to work on Amina's hands, dipping the stick in the paste and painting it onto her skin. The vines and the leaves seemed to pour out of the stick effortlessly. As much talking and gesturing as Hanuti did, she barely looked down to check her work, but it was an intricate balance, as if she'd given it all the attention in the world. The conversation suddenly switched to Amina. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm Hakeem Ziabe, uh, Shamara's husband, and watching her go through the process of writing this book has been an amazing experience. We um, long nights, early mornings, all day with the children, <laughs> and then doing everything afterwards, uh, trying to relieve as much as I can, but she kind of just does a lot anyway, right? Um, but watching this book come out um, from the idea, from just an idea and her knowledge in general is amazing, but watching her compile it all in one place, make it palatable, enjoyable to read. I was up at night proofing it and I'm I'm ready to wake her up because I'm upset about what the char- characters are doing. Um, it, it just became more and more real. And I, I see the need for this type of communication between each other. And sometimes it is um, is for the women and the girls to just come together and share the knowledge. Um, just like you're doing right now, you're you know, with this young lady and she's she's soaking it up, even if she's, you know, a little somewhere else, but she's also <laughs> hearing everything. You know, she knows what's talking about her right now. <laughs> but I think it's really important for us to share that information with each other in different levels. And this is an amazing way to do it. And the the enrichment that I see the women who come into her tent or come into our studio home, um, her studio in our home, um, I see their faces and I see the healing that takes place with every end of this So I guess we'll open for question and answer. So, um, I, I, one of the biggest questions I have is for someone who may not know much about henna um, and is just kind of learning, what is one of the most important things that she would say is like something that you you should know or will stick with you and you should carry as you go on your journey to learning about henna? Well, that's a good question. Um, so I'm assuming that you're saying someone who um, wants to do henna professionally um, or someone who's just kind of exploring and getting into the art of 
Okay. All right. Um, I would say um, it's important um, when you're doing henna um, to definitely know the designs, like the symbols that you're using, to definitely know like the meanings of them and um, to use them with purpose. Um, and to give credit to like where they come from as far as like, you know, this comes from this region of the world or this tribe or this, you know, people, whichever. I think it's always important um, in, in your work, even in just exploring uh, to do that. Um, so yeah, keep the energy good. Also know like what you're, what you're doing too. And it makes it more of a deeper and enriching experience as you explore. Hi, I'm a good friend of Jamora. So, <laughs> so proud of her. But um, my question is, what inspired you? He didn't already answer this. What inspired you to write such a wonderful book? Oh, thank you so much for that question. We did. Somebody did ask me that earlier. <laughs> so I was just saying um, how I started out with um, with it as a, as a class, and then it basically the class became a book. And how I just really wanted to put um, a book about henna out there that was from the African tradition of henna. Thank you. What was your research process like? I'm sure like a lot of the stuff was harder to find. So like finding those, I don't know, hidden because as you said, like a lot of literature surrounding henna right now is like very focused on Southeast or South Asia and like mm -hmm. the traditions there. So how did you, yeah, what was your reason? I would say I pulled from um, a lot, I mean, a lot of the stories and everything are what I actually witnessed and heard growing up. Um, so I really, it actually was quite a process of pulling from my memory and I actually would call on my aunts and be like, I don't remember how that story went. Can you repeat that? Like, or do you remember how that went? Um, so it was a lot of calling friends and family. Um, and also, I mean, I, I use information from like my travels. So when I like, lived in Senegal and then like connections that I have throughout Mauritania, Senegal um, and Morocco, um, you know, so like, exchanging information with them and also just remembering from my trips, like, you know, when they did my henna or when I was just part of different ceremonies there, um, just being really attentive and asking questions because they have different processes. Like I remember when I went, um, I was in um, Dakar and they did my henna and they put like ashes on my hands. And then they did this thing where they like, you know, burned the clothes. And I was just kind of like, oh, you know, I've been to plenty of like henna parties and everything, but we had never did that. But I noticed it made it really darker. It made it like black when they did it. So a lot of it was like, pulling from my own um, travels and memory and from my childhood. And um, it took years. This wasn't something, I mean, it took, honestly, it took me, I would say, a good five years to write this book. Um, and uh, there isn't, even when you talk about, like you said, um, Indian henna or Southeast, you know, the, the beautiful um, henna they have, even that is like limited as to what you can pull like from a library or anything like that. So also the, a lot of books that you find just um, about women in those regions, you will find something come up about henna a lot of times, just from other peripheral books that have, you know, that have been written generally. Every now and then there'll be an excerpt there and I would just hang on to that and like, you know. So um, it was, you know, definitely like looking through a haystack, I feel like for a lot of information. I hope that answers some of your questions. Yeah. You're welcome. I'm the, I'm the events guy, you go first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we had a phrase in this question. Well, you mentioned like the sisterhood and bringing people together, women coming to your tent, your studio, or all the ritual involved. Um, how do your role in community as a culture bearer? And what was it like for you to step into that role? and how do you prepare yourself to take that on? Just what are the dimensions to that? And even if you can speak historically, how it sounds like in the novel portion it's alluded to, but how have henna artists been viewed in community? Um, is it a role of stature or has it been hard to fight for that respect? Or yeah, just what I'm sure it's- Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so henna historically, um, was done by women who were poor. And even when you travel to um, 
at least my experience of traveling like through West Africa and um, I've also traveled through Pakistan and Kuwait. Um, it is the poor, it's usually young girls who are begging. Um, actually now though, you are starting to see men um, who are doing henna now. Um, but to, what you usually see is um, it is for people and there isn't a lot of um, respect. It's just, it's not really seen as art at all. Um, people don't expect to pay anything. If they do, they pay very little. And so the attitudes coming over into the States is, is that, you know, and so it's interesting because it's richer people who, um, who wear it, you know, and traditionally it was the royals and, you know, regal families, the women that were regal families. And, you know, you have to, it was rich people who wore it, but it was poor people who did the art. So, and, and because I think because it's a women's art and it, on top of that, it's a melanated women's art or an African women's art, it's not a lot of respect and it's not seen as art and it's not something that um, is, um, yeah, that is well paid for. Uh, I feel like that's changing. And I think that's definitely changing with women like myself and a lot of artists um, who are coming, you know, who are coming into it now where, you know, people, you know, still want it for their weddings and their naming ceremonies and their birth. You like this appreciation, but that's, that's been a long time coming. So my role, obviously, as you alluded to a little bit, is like culture keeper. And as she said, I'm curry of the feminine arts. Um, so it's basically our, our model is healing women to the feminine arts. Uh, healing people to the feminine arts. And so my that is my role is basically this as a outlet um, and as a way to uh, for women to connect and bonds and um, to heal. Um, and that is what I facilitate. Um, I do first moon parties. Um, I do um, rites of the passages for girls. Um, you know, women pretty much when it's that time, they just come to me and they're like, I'm thinking of doing this for my daughter or my, you know, daughter's having a baby, you know, so sometimes it's the belly henna, other than this for a photography shoot. And I just love, I feel like right now women are having, I feel like it's the women's renaissance, you know, it's like a sisterhood renaissance happening where we are like reconnecting with those roots and we are taking that time out for ourselves and caring. And we're in a place now in society where we can do that. Well, that might be different for our mothers or our grandmothers, you know, who, at least in my experience, are very hardworking women and had come from a long line of hardworking, hardworking women that didn't have time to pamper themselves, you know. Um, and so now being in a place where, you know, I can do that and a lot of women in my generation that can do that, you know, it's just, it's revolutionary. And that's why I see my role. Uh, we have time for at least one or two more if anyone else has a question. I'll get to mine then. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the communities, especially across the African diaspora that practice henna and how you've been able to engage with them? And Empress, if you have some, some input on that as well, I'd love to hear a bit more. That's a lot, man. <laughs> um, the communities across the world, um, wow. I don't know. It's it's hard to. I don't think that henna artists are necessarily even consider themselves artists um, at this point. They're a lot of them are just either they're trying to survive or they are um, like they do it for tourists um, or they're just a young girl in the family who just does it kind of like as a um, elective or like you know it's like her hobby. You know, um, I think it's just now kind of coming into the world as like. This is art, you know, and I am, you know, even to say like I'm a henna artist, it's not like a new, the only way they were really used before was in the ceremony. Um, and that wasn't necessarily something that you like got paid for, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so like we're not really like an organized community at this point. So the community is like when I do travel and I do and like in my own family and there's other, you know, girls who are, you know, doing henna art and stuff, there are starting to be events now like. I saw like they're like in a competitions now, and you'll see like um, that there there was like a henna henna con or henna conference um, that was going on, and there'll be like workshops here and there. So it's starting we're starting to build up now, um, and I think it's so important because 
I feel like it's so elusive because henna is not something that like it's different when you paint a picture and you put it in a frame and you can make prints of it and you know it can go up on the wall. Henna is something that once you do the design, it's it fades off the skin and it's done. I can tell you, I've probably done thousands that I never even recorded that I created off the top of my head from freestyling and it's just gone. I'll never see it again. And it's kind of the beauty of it too. But this is what it is. So now that we're in a place where we have the technology. And we and women in a place where we can oh, actually Snapchat. <laughs> where we can actually capture these designs and now actually organize and be a community. Um, you know, most of my experiences as far as like of working with you know other henna artists, um, and now I have that we do events together and things like that. But as far as with traveling and across the diaspora, it's really just like women bringing you into their home and loving you, you know, and being like, we're gonna have some tea and I'm gonna I'm gonna decorate you. You know, and that has been, you know, everything. And a lot of times they don't even know you don't take it to the neighbor's house or whatever. They just, you know, heard of you from aunt so and so and you just automatically connected in and you're just automatically there. So and then you get to know each other. Yeah. And then you get to know their methods. Like they everyone has a different spin on like how they mix their paints. It's like these secret recipes. And that's another thing that was kind of hard about doing the book is that. A lot of this was information that is, you know, even going into doing henna as a business, a lot of it was like secret recipes. And I was told by family members, like, don't give everything, like, don't give it all. <laughs> so this is kind of like a tough place to be in. And, um, but at the same time, when you're in business, people have to know, first of all, what you're using, because if they have an allergy or something like that, and this is a, a consumer aspect of it, you know, People need to know, and I, my attitude about it was like, I can tell you who's in this, but doesn't mean you can mix it the way I do. So there you go. <laughs> you know? So I feel like people have a right to know what's in it. And so I do share, um, and there are some recipes I have kept to myself. But yeah, and there's some things, but yeah, there's a fine line and knowing where that boundary is. Awesome. Uh, my experience with Hena, uh now that I've, I've I've had many cultures uh, that I experienced doing henna with. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had Sudanese henna. I've had um, uh, Mauritania. Mauritania. I have uh, uh, Carter. I have, you know, different. Somali, uh, Ethiopian. Ethiopian, <laughs> um, uh, Gambian, Senegal, uh, Senegalese. Mm -hmm. I've experienced different types of henna now from the Middle East to Africa. And I can say it's so very different. Each one has their own type of style. Mm -hmm. um, they have their, even their own traditions in, in regards to doing it. And I know one of the things that I've experienced with a lot of women um, uh, in the African community, when you're a, a group of you all are sitting, it's like, you know, yeah, they don't ask for you to pay them. That's what, one of the things why a lot of henna artists sometimes don't get paid what I feel that they should get paid because they grew up with the mindset like, no, 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 don't worry about it. I'm just doing this for you. And I'm like, no, 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 right? I don't want to do this. And then they're like, well, I'm doing her henna, so I'm going to do your henna. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it, it's a lot of giving and love in it, which which is it, it feels good to be around people like that, that sometimes we miss out here in the West because uh, we're so uh, me-oriented and self-oriented that when you're around someone that's so willing to give up your time, you know, it, it makes you realize it's more than just the henna. You're seeing, you're seeing the, the, that person's soul, um, what they're offering to you and, and the love that they're putting into you because that's actually time where you're sitting there and it's, energy and it, and it's mm -hmm. the energy and they're focusing in the intricacy and they make it so beautiful and it's just like uh, it's like a love letter that no one's going to see mm -hmm. a, a few days and that's like, I love the way you put that a love letter it, it is, is absolutely like love letter. and one of the things that like with Shamora where she changed my attitude towards panel artists to respect their time is the personal love that she gave to me in the whole process and, and how she just kind of took it to the next level as a friend. 
because I've had out, you know, you you expect hospitality from strangers sometimes and you're going, you know, Tina. But this was the kind of like she just was like taking care of me from the inside out. And and so experiencing that, I was like, I see the importance of us really keeping this art alive as far as women are concerned, because we are so hard work and we give so much of ourselves. So to have someone give to us in return to fill our cup is a blessing. And it's an art that we should definitely hold on to, keep tight and give it to our daughters because our daughters are gonna need it. Our granddaughters are gonna need it because you know how they say, you know, you educate a woman, you educate a nation. And it's the same thing with everything, with love. And, and this is just seems so simple, some henna, but when the, the whole culture behind it that a lot of us are missing out on, it needs to stay alive. It needs to stay alive. And that's what we're doing here. Yeah. Keeping it alive. Thank you. Thank <laughs> You're you. <welcome. laughs> Wonderful. Thank you both so much. Uh, we're going to take a second to transition into the next portion here. Um, feel free to stick around and mingle. We're going to have some peppermint tea, watch yeah. a beautiful, um, some videos and set up the table for you all over here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We had a ton of beautiful messages on the live stream as well. We said, beautiful, this book is a blessing. This is wonderful. I'm buying the book right now. <laughs> Bless up and peace to Henoglyphics, etc. So, <laughs> the music I do. Watching, make sure you um, check out a book. How can we get the book? Um, and this is my Like, you know, do that on. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. We're in one place for a long time. Yeah. 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 Flow culture yeah. there. Right, right. Like, I feel like I really felt that watching the bride with her yeah. hands on her feet on and just around chatting. Yeah. Like, oh, right. Yeah. 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 You are. Right. That's the thing. Yeah. You can't really do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Like, she was so very Right. Okay. So then it's like, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.